Hi guys and welcome to History Infection. This time I'm talking about rabies. Rabies was one of my childhood nightmares and I'm pretty sure I'm not alone. Although rabies has never really caused a plague like Yersinia or cholera, it still is a killer of man and beast in such a horrible way. Growing up in a tropical climate like I did, rabies was something of a boogeyman to me. When you hear that there's a disease out there that has no treatment and can drive you mad, you begin to understand just how terrifying it must have been before there was a vaccine. The word rabies might come from the same root word as to rave, or it might be derived from the Sanskrit word to do violence. The scientific name for the virus is derived from the Greek word to do violence, which is lysa. This is effectively a description of how rabies affects people and animals. People and animals become disoriented, show signs of mania, aggression, or even sometimes, occasionally, they can show signs of a complete lackless, like just lying down and not wanting to move. The classic sign is also a massive amounts of saliva being produced and a foaming from the mouth. Rabies is a virus, which means it can't be treated with antibiotics. Although it doesn't really have a treatment, you can get treated. As confusing as that sounds, this is because the treatment is actually a vaccine and because rabies takes such a long time to actually infect you and kill you, the vaccine has a long enough time to work to actually make you immune to the virus even after you've been exposed to it. The rabies vaccination was one of the first great achievements, in my opinion, of modern medicine. It involves someone who biology owes a great deal to. Louise Pasteur. Not just content with disproving spontaneous generation and lending his name to the process of sterilizing milk and also giving us a great understanding of actually how fermentation works, which most beer companies owe their existence to, we have vaccinations for rabies and anthrax to thank him for. His last work was published in 1886, a hundred years before I was born, and it was the treatment of rabies in which he details how he produced his vaccine and how he tested it on dogs and a couple of humans. Pasteur and a colleague called Pierre Rox, whose name I've probably just mispronounced, although he did have the original idea, used desiccated spinal cords of rabies infected rabbits to produce a vaccine which they would inject. Pasteur already had some success in developing an anthrax vaccine, although he may have lied about the method he used when he began working with it, although he did later perfect this method, it just probably wasn't working when he said it was working. His new rabies vaccine was tested on 10 dogs successfully, and then came a moment that would change history. Pastor got the chance to test his vaccine on a human. A nine-year-old boy by the name of Joseph Minister is mauled by an apparently rabid dog, and his family rushed him to this medical institution where they, they've heard of a great scientist working on a cure for rabies. Pastor himself sees the boy and decides to try his new vaccine as a post-exposure prophylaxis. This is a brave move, mainly because Pastor is not licensed to practice medicine. This would be the equivalent of me going out and trying to inject some chemicals from my lab into someone. Simply put, it's just illegal. However, Pastor said of this moment, as the death of this child appeared inevitable, I decided not without deep and severe unease, as one can well imagine, to try out on Joseph Minister the procedure which had consistently worked on dogs. Joseph survived, and luckily for Pastor, no one pressed charges on him for practicing medicine without a license. Joseph may or may not develop rabies as a result of his encounter with the rabid dog. Some people have estimated there's only really about a 15% chance that he would actually get rabies from his attack. However, this success story opened the way for more people to trust the treatment. Joseph would go on to fight in the First World War, and by the time of the Second World War, he was the caretaker of the pastor institution. And a common held belief, although probably not true, is that he committed suicide as he could not stop the Nazi troops from entering Pastor's tomb. As a nine-year-old himself, Pastor had witnessed the death of many people in his own village when a, a rabid mad wolf came into town one day and attacked many people. It's claimed from this point that Pastor developed a deep, seething hatred for the rabies virus and sought to actually eradicate it, and when his last publication he managed to come up with the vaccine to treat it. After Joseph, a shepherd's boy by the name of John Baptiste Julipip was brought to Pasteur. John had fended off a rabid dog from attacking a group of small children. This gave Pasteur the chance to prove his treatment wasn't just a fluke. News spread from the success of Joseph and John 
and soon a group of 38 Russian peasants who had been attacked and mauled by a rabid wolf arrived, and Pasteur and his colleague were able to save 35 out of the 38 people who arrived that day. In 1888, the Pasteur Institute was opened on the back of Pasteur's many discoveries and contributions to the biological field. He was also, it should be mentioned, an accomplished chemist and physicist making contributions to both these fields. Rabies cases are actually falling across the globe due to careful and considered vaccinations of wild reservoirs and vectors. Britain was declared rabies free in 1922. The USA isn't as lucky as us Brits and rabies can still be found throughout the US. This leads us on to our second bit of history, the Milwaukee Protocol. The Milwaukee Protocol was developed by Dr. Rodney Wilborough and first used to treat 14-year-old Jenna Geese. Jenna picked up a bat one day on her way home and the bat bit her. 37 days later, she was admitted to hospital with a high fever and some other strange symptoms. She tested negative for everything the doctors could think of until the bat bite came to light and this started alarm bells ringing throughout the medical staff as bats are a natural carrier of rabies viruses and rabies-like viruses as well. Samples were sent to the CDC and they confirmed that she did in fact have rabies. Autopsies of rabies patients show that death tends to occur due to temporary brain dysfunction with no actual physical brain damage. This means if you could somehow stop the person's immune system from trashing the brain, there wouldn't be any long-term damage. So if you gave them a chance for their body to fight off the infection without them damaging their brain, they should survive. And this is exactly what Jenna's physicians tried that day. They induced a coma with ketamine and gave her some antiretrovirals to try and treat the rabies and gave her immune system time to attack the virus itself. Jenna actually has a YouTube channel, which there's a link for here, where she talks about her experiences and her life. One day people will look back at her the same way we look back at Joseph and Jean and other great cases of survivors from deadly diseases. So it's well worth it. Go check her channel out. Fortunately for most people, the vaccine can be administered post-infection. It's what's known as a post-prophylactic treatment. This gives people time to actually seek medical treatment. However, you have to get the vaccine before you start to show any real symptoms. Although it's possible that the cases of rabies are actually vastly underreported, under a report in 2010 suggested that rabies might be far more common than we are expecting and thinking, but just doesn't cause any symptoms or pathology. The CDC worked looking at two villages in the Amazon and took blood from 63 individuals, and seven of them were shown to have antibodies for rabies, and you only get antibodies if you've been exposed to something. I must state a couple of things here. This doesn't necessarily hold true for the rest of the world. These people might be somehow genetically resistant in some way to rabies, or more likely, they are exposed to the virus in very small doses repeatedly, building up an immunity, the exact same way that a vaccine works. You expose the body to either a dead or destroyed or similar structure and allow the body to develop its immune response to that structure. So if they encounter rabies viruses commonly, but not at a high enough level to infect them, they can start to develop a natural immunity, sorry, actually an acquired immunity, to the rabies virus. Briefly to finish, if you are traveling in a region with rabies, speak to your doctor about prevention, and if you suspect something, seek medical attention. So that's a brief history of rabies. Like with all these other stories I've been talking about, there's far more to them, and I'm probably going to go back to some of them and revisit and tell different parts of the stories as well, so don't feel like I've missed anything out. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, feel free to subscribe and like, and if you have any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll try to get back to you. Next time I'm talking about ergot and dance dance fever. I hope you join me then. Thanks for watching.